Now I can hear myself. Hey, hello everybody. My name is uh, Robert. Oh, now it's stronger. My name is uh, Robert Rioux. I am the Director of Innovation and Technology at Real by Fake. It's a VFX company based in Montreal and we have an office in Los Angeles and in Mexico. So Director of Innovation and Technology, that means that my job is to find the latest, greatest technology and bring it to Real by Fake. But before that, I was a CG supervisor at the company and I want to show you the latest project I worked on, the last project I worked on as CG supervisor at Real by Fake, and it's called Aftermath. It's a feature film. And uh, we did over 600 shots, CG shots in Blender in it. It was the biggest job we ever did uh, in Blender. And uh, I'm going to show you everything that went well and everything that went bad at the same time, because uh, there were many things. I also have a, a, a uh, YouTube channel called Blender Bob. So a show of hands, how many of you guys have seen my channel? Whoa, OK, pretty much 50%. So that's good. That's good. That means the other 50%, you can go check it out on YouTube, Blender Bob. So I talk about the visual effects. Uh, um, the goal of the, uh, the channel is to show that Blender is a viable tool to use, uh, to use it for VFX. So yeah, many clips that I did, more than that, actually. The second one, Who Cares, is my most popular one. Check it out. So last year I came here, I did a, at the Beacon conference and I was talking about the pipeline we use at Real by Fake and I've shown this shot here. That was the only shot I was authorized to show. And you can see the before and after since last year, we only added the blinking thing and we made the bridge a little bit longer. But now I'm gonna show you everything else that we did on this, uh, it's kind of dark. Can we lower the lights, please? Like uh, we're all adults, you can go down. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. So what I presented last year was that the idea was that everything would be linked and we would use library overrides everywhere. So the modeling would be linked into the look dev, look dev would be link, linked into the rigging, and if there's no rigging, it goes straight to layout, and the layout scene is linked into the animation, and animation and lighting, VFX is separate, then we mix everything together, right? That's the theory, and it works for small projects, but when you work on bigger projects, it becomes more complicated. So the scenes were so heavy that uh, it broke everything. Uh, it, it, our pipeline completely broke, so we had to adjust it as we were doing our stuff. So modeling, once the modeling was done, we just renamed it look dev, and we just did the look dev directly into this scene. That's how we had to do it. We did link in the rigging, so that was fine, and we linked everything in the layout, but then we had another issue, it, it was that if we changed the look dev and we opened the layout scene, it wouldn't work. So we had to do what we call the round trip, where we had to reopen the rigging scene just to kind, kind of update it, just open, save, and reopen it into the layout for, this, for it to work. So it was like completely insane because we had so many assets like this, it was, uh, it was a, a, a bit of a nightmare. And for the layout, animation, and lighting, we just updated the scene. So once the layout was done, we just renamed it animation and then renamed it lighting. It's not actually renaming because our pipeline is more complicated than that, but that's the, the simple version of uh, how we did this. We had other issue, issues also, because we have a bridge. Uh, the, the main asset for this uh, show is a bridge, and the bridge is made of a lot of collections. And the idea was that we would just unlink all the collections that we don't want. But there's a bug in Blender. If you remove a link that is under another collection, it's not going to work. When you, you reopen the scene, everything is going to come back. And that was really problematic for us because the bridge is 1.6 gigabyte. So every time you had to reload all this stuff, it's like, ah, ah, ah. So what we did instead was to load the entire thing, and we just checked out the visibility of the, of the thing. And I realized this bug actually when I was doing this presentation, because I was like, how come it doesn't work? And then I figured out, oh, it's when a collection is under another collection, that's where it breaks. If you just have collections and you, 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 you unlink them, it works, but if they're under another collection, it doesn't work. Another thing that saved our life was 3.3 .3 when it came out, because there's a problem also that we had in, uh, in Blender, is that if we did a library overwrite on one object on the bridge, it would do a library overwrite on every single object in the bridge and everything became so slow, it was unusable, it was driving us crazy. 3.3 .3 fixed it, and then we could like start relaxing, relaxing and start doing our job the way we expected it to be done. 
Fog was a serious issue because uh, the bridge, well, they filmed in the studio and uh, they did part of the bridge in the studio and they put a lot of fog, so we had to make fog to match the plates. And rendering the fogs, the bridge has 300 lights in it, plus all the cars. It was so, the render times were just enormous. We had to do all the fog in comp. So all the shots that you will see, except for the lights, for the, the, the fog for the, the lights, all the fog you will see on all the shots, I will show you all the fog is done in comp. So the main issue, uh, heavy geometry. Uh, we, when we started this project, uh, we had uh, AD, NVIDIA A2080 cards and we couldn't handle the, the bridge. It was too heavy. So we had to make a low res version of the bridge and we could switch on and off. Now it would have been nice, it, it would be nice if Blender had a system like you have in RenderMan or in Arnold where you could have a proxy model and only at render time it will load the high res model. You have options like uh, Loadify and other, and other systems that exist, but they still load everything in the scene. And this is what we wanted to avoid. We didn't want to load 1.6 gigabyte of data every time we wanted to work on the bridge. So when we switched for the 4090, it was not an issue anymore. I will show you the bridge where the 4090 just goes like super fast. So that fixed the problem. Too many links, uh, level and overrides. I told you that uh, we fixed this by just copying the scene. It was a, a, you know, a stupid workaround, but that's the way we did it. Layer overrides was fixed with a 3.3. Heavy textures, that's another issue. Uh, Cycles doesn't, doesn't have MIP mapping. If you don't know what MIP mapping is, uh, it's like one huge texture. You could have like an 8K texture, and in the same file, you have a 4K, 2K, 1K, 512, and goes down, I think, to 32 by 32. And at render time, the renderer will say, okay, this object is far away. I don't need an 8K texture there. I'm just going to load the 512. So you save a lot of memory doing this. Cycles doesn't have this. Every other renderer on the planet does, uh, has it, but Cycle doesn't have it. I know, I know that they're working on it, but we didn't have it at the time. So the only thing we could do is to go to simplify and reduce the textures. But if we have shots where we see the bridge from far away and then we get super close, then we get into an issue because we don't have enough resolution when you get into close-up. So that was a bit complicated. Uh, the proxy system, I talked about it, and here goes the plant. It's okay, nobody's watching you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, the proxy system, I talked about it. Uh, too many lights uh, for the fog, uh, that was a problem also because we had uh, just, as I said, 300 lights, so we had a lot of noise for the fog, it was impossible to render. And the render times, uh, they were very long and uh, we wanted to render in GPU, so we had to keep everything under 25 gigabytes of VRAM. So for a lot of you guys, 25 is like, 24 is like, hey, I'm never gonna reach that. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, so it, it, it's, it wasn't enough. So this is the bridge, it's the Tobin Bridge in, uh, in Boston. It's a real bridge and obviously we cannot shut down the bridge just to shoot a movie because it's a, it's a bridge, they need it. So we had to go to plan B, which is doing it in CG. Yay, more job for us. So that's the bridge here. And this is with a 6088 graphics card with uh, 48 gigs of VRAM, so it goes super fast. It's, there's no problem with it. Uh, here's the wireframe, and you can see some parts are denser. That's because we break these parts and we distort them. And um, we can see also that's like, you know, it's uh, 15 million polygons. It goes super fast with this card, but the 2080 was just choking on that bridge. Uh, so we have uh, many uh, sections of the bridge, so we can turn them on and off. So if we just look at the north part and we don't want to load everything in the back for nothing, so we'll just turn it off. And you will see also that we have so an override. Okay, we have sub, sub collections also. And we have a driver uh, lattice and override here because the bridge is curved. The real bridge is curved, but when they shot in the studio, they made part of the bridge, it was flat. So we had, to be, uh, we had to find a way to make the bridge go flat or curve, depending if it was an outside shot, a drone shot, or if it was a studio shot. So now we could have a straight flat bridge. I'm gonna show you what it looks like if we look at it on the viewport with all the textured, textures loaded at full resolution, because the, uh, the 6080 has uh, 48 gigs of VRAM. So this is the real time it takes to load it. But you will see a shift, but uh, that's actually the real time it takes. So I wanted to show you how long it takes. And that's it. So it's pretty fast. And uh, this is the bridge with all the textures. And if I move around, see the refresh is really fast. You can see the rendering, the, sample, the sampling at 128, and it just goes like poof, super fast. We rendered the entire movie at 128 most of the time, sometimes 256, but we didn't need to go more than that because we used the denoiser. 
so our, for, for the bridge. For the outside of the bridge, for the environment, what we did, we did some drone shots, but they were shot outside the bridge at different angles, and we would film at 45 degree angles, and we would stitch them together to have a nice long video that we would put in a card in the background, on a, on a cylinder actually. But that was done in comp. So we had the cameras in Blender, we would export them in uh, Alembic, and in Nuke, they could load their cameras, and they did the background in, in comp. So we, had all, we would cover every part of the bridge like this. So depending on which area of the bridge we were, we would take the background that corresponds to this. So this is the set. Um, they did, it's, it's not that long because the studio, there's a limit in how long you can do in a studio. But we had like 30 cars maybe on the bridge. So if they filmed a section, they bring all the cars, then they need another section. They had to remove all the cars, bring all the other cars, and they kept switching the cars like this all the time. And the cars were not always exactly at the same place. So sometimes we had some like, hey, wasn't this car supposed to be there? And uh, so some issues like this. And you can see there's a blue screen in the back, but not on the sides. So that means we had to do some roto. So some of the assets, uh, this is the pickup for the main, uh, the main character. Uh, it was important to match exactly the references. So uh, like this car is dirty in front and everything because there was a blow up. So uh, the car is, uh, has dirt and dust on it. So we had to match the real thing. Jesus truck here. Uh, all the cars, we found them uh, on the, you can buy them from different websites. This one was impossible to find. We only found one that was a, a 3D printing uh, thing and it was only the body. There was nothing else on it. So we had to build everything else around it. So a bunch of cars like that, that we did, like that, that we did. It's really, really difficult to make a, a photorealistic car. I don't know if you ever tried. And now we had to deal with cars at night and in a foggy environment. And in a foggy environment, it's complicated because all the reflections become dull. And you make your car and it doesn't look real. It looks like a cheap CG car. But there's something that helps a lot. It's called compositing. So you can do all your, your, your reflections and everything. You output the glossy part. And in comp, they can use a crypto mat to just isolate like the, the, the body, the, the paint job. Not the paint job, but the painted parts and blurred them to try to match the plate. Because sometimes we would have the real cars and the CG cars together, so they had to match. So motorcycle, we have a drone here. We bought the drone, we just added the, uh, the, the gun under it. it. Can shoot, bang, bang, bang. This movie is like a Die Hard on a Bridge. So yeah, it is, that's how it's, it was sold. It's Die Hard on a Bridge. So. Like this uh, police truck here, you can see there's some dirt on the side. We took pictures of the real truck and we just mapped it on the side to make sure that we have the same, uh, the same uh, dirt. The characters, uh, we had uh, some CG characters for CG takeovers. They look kind of uh, gamish, uh, game, you know, video gamish. That's because usually they are like far away and uh, in the dark, in the fog and everything. We don't see all the details, so we're not going to waste time doing stuff that we don't need to see. This one is the main character. This, this guy has more details on him. And the, the bad guys, they all, all had masks. So well, they're all the same mask, just different paint, paint job. OK, let's start with some shots. So this is a very boring shot here. Uh, you can see there's a little uh, bush right there, here. And I don't really need my laser pointer, but I just wanted to show off that it's blue and not green and red, so yeah. No, but uh, what I want to show you is that uh, there are little branches here. You will see they removed that bush, but they kept the branch just to keep the depth and everything. So they just yeah, wrote all these little branches. So this is what we did with it. So we added the Tobin Bridge uh, board. Uh, the, the, there's a building on the left and the bridge in the back in the city. And you see the bush is gone, but the little branches are still there. Then we get into something more complicated. This shot was obviously shot in a studio. You can see the crew and the panels reflecting on the car. So there's no way we could keep the pickup truck. We had to change the entire thing. And the shot is actually much longer than this. So we needed to, to elongate it. So we had to track the shot and then continue, extend the camera to make it longer. This is the layout. I'm not going to show you 600 shots like this, don't worry. This is the light pass. And if you look at it, it doesn't look that realistic. I mean, it looks, looks okay, but it, it's not photoreal. Uh, but it's okay, because 
compositing is your friend. And when you do CG shots, 50% of the shot is compositing, 50% is CG. You will never get something that looks photoreal straight from CG. Compositing changes everything, and this is what I mean. And this, uh, you know, I told you about the drone shot that we did in the background. We did it at different time of day so that we could have, like, this is just before uh, it becomes completely dark. And now we have the fog. So this is a shot in the studio that doesn't have any VFX in it. I just wanted to show you how much fog they put when they shot it. So it's a way for them to just, okay, we don't need to do a blue screen on this one. We're going to save money. We're just going to put a lot of fog. Uh, but not all the shots were equal because it's a fog machine. So sometimes you have a lot of fog, sometimes you don't have enough. So we had to adjust for every shot to have a continuity that would uh, work. And we had some shots like this also where the, the car lights are off, but they're supposed to be on. Oh, so we had like the first, the first day they shot, all the lights were off and then they were on for the rest. So we had to turn them on. And that was not done in, uh, in uh, CG actually, it's just done in comp, but we needed to track the car and add little fog in it and uh, you know cloudy stuff. That's a typical uh, shot that we had here. So it's a drone shot. Now this bridge has been blown up in the center and we need to replace the bridge. So what are we going to do? Paint it out? Uh, we're going to keep the real bridge, paint out the cars? No, no, no. We need to replace the entire thing. It's much easier than trying to fix what's already there. And it's a long shot. So the first thing you need to do is to get a track. You need to get a perfect track. So you need to undistort the plate, track it, make sure it's okay. You do your CG stuff and then you re-distort it. So we have a very, very, very tight uh, track. This is the layout. And you can see the bottom part, that's the plate. We kept this part, it's good. We don't need to change it. What we need to change is what's behind the bridge. So we need to make sure that you won't be able to tell the difference between what's behind the bridge and what's under the bridge. A little occlusion, occlusion, some animation and some effects. Yeah, the effects were done in another software. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the final shot. So it's completely seamless. You cannot tell that the background is uh, replaced and the, the mix between the, the plate and the background that we shot with the drone. So uh, it works perfectly. Sometimes we get some uh, shots. Oh, that's another one I want to show you. That's, uh, uh, in, in this case, the camera was going one way. This is what they shot. But you know, when you do a show, the shots keep evolving and changing and changing. And at the end, well, the shot is going the other way. It's full CG. So uh, the camera is moving the other direction. So it was just something they put as placeholder for the editing. And then we had to change everything. So that's the lighting pass and the comp, again, with that foggy environment. So now we're getting pretty, co pretty close in the real estate, in the photo real stuff. Uh, yeah, and you have to remember also that all the shots that I'm showing you, they're going to go through a color grading after this. So this is what's coming out from, from the CG. So we have the plate and they give us a lot or whatever, and we need to match what they do, but they will make another pass after this. But that's not, we don't do That's not our department. Uh, we don't do the color grading. So that's the beauty of going CG here. So we can do any camera movement that we want. So if the director wants this angle, this angle, this angle, we can do it, no problem. We have the entire bridge, we have all the cars, we can do whatever they request. So I'm not just gonna show you some bridge shots. and it's gonna get more interesting later. But these are interesting because they have a lot of like big camera movement and we had to keep the background and everything. So I will show you this shot later where we added some people in this. Helicopter shot. And uh, I added this one just because I liked it. I thought it, looks, it looked pretty cool. I should have put the, the original, the plate, so that you could see it's just a little part of the bridge and everything else is a CG around it. But nah, yeah, I didn't have time. Okay. Now we have some uh, VFX, some explosion. So on set, they did an explosion. It's not supposed to be the real explosion because it's way bigger in real life. Uh, well, not in real life, but what they expect. But we wanted to get some interactive light, so reflections on the car and everything. And this is what we did. So we added some cars in the back, we added the explosion, and uh, we uh, made the bridge longer, added the background. This shot here, this is the lighting pass here. And uh, we see it better with the occlusion because it's kind of dark and we always like to watch an occlusion pass because it always looks good. 
I wouldn't make an entire movie just in occlusion. I think I would call it occlusion. And this is with the comp. So they added a lot of particles. So we don't necessarily need to do particles in CG. They have a lot of elements that they can use in comp and they just, from different libraries and stuff. And they just bring it and they just render it straight into the, uh, uh, into the, the compositing. So same thing with this. When you look at this, it doesn't look like a cool movie shot. But after the compositing, then yay, cool shot. Now, I talk about compositing. If you look at this one, it looks like super boring. And this is what they did in compositing. So you see, it's day and night. It doesn't even look like the same shot. Uh, that's how much they will push some stuff. And all these little particles and stuff, it's probably from a bank of uh, the, just uh, some effects bank, and they just added it in the shot. So another nice shot of the bridge here. Helicopter shots. All right. Now. Some action. Uh, we have two people on a bicycle, they're on a rig. The rig moves, the camera moves, and they're supposed to move on the bridge. So we needed to do a track, so that's the tracking shot. And it's really hard to track because they didn't necessarily put trackers everywhere. There's nothing to give us depth, so uh, they should have put some, you know, other things on set, just poles and stuff, a, a light stand, whatever, so that we have something to track. But we don't always have it, so we have to deal with it. And uh, this is the lower, the low res bridge that we had before. You can see they flipped the plate, so the girl is looking on the other side. And that uh, at the beginning, when we we're using the 2080 graphics card, we had to use a lower, lower resolution bridge. That was uh, the bridge we gave it to compositing because uh, you don't want to bring a 15 million polygon model into Nuke; it's just going to choke. So. Uh, that's the lighting pass, and you can see that we have the uh, the, the, the two people in in the shot. That's just an image plane and a background image that we put in front. Uh, compositing would give us, they, they would do the blue screen for us. They will do the, the keying, give it to us so that we can adjust the lighting with the plate to make sure that it's going to match. And the final shot looks like this. So uh, we prefer to make the shots lighter and in comp, they can make it darker and keep the details they want and play with the contrast and everything. So that's why our shots, when you look at them, sometimes they look like, hey, it could have worked more. No, 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 we'll look at the final shot. So another shot like this, and you can see her hair is free-flowing in the air. That's really hard to, to key, and they did an incredible job. Uh, we're very good at keying stuff uh, at Real by Fake. Uh, so this one had a plate. The other one was full cheesy, but this one had a plate, so we had to track it and make sure that our vehicles are, vehicles are at the right place. And this is the lighting shot. Well, it looks like crap because you have the cheap blue screen on top, so uh, on the edges it looks kind of funky, but that's the final shot here and goes super fast in the movie, so there's a lot of action going on. And, uh, this one is for CG, so we have two characters in the... Ah, uh, well, we don't see anything. Okay, <laughs> it looks nice on my screen, but uh, this, this movie is called Charcoal. Okay, yeah, that's better. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, just, just, to, just to check. Yeah, just, I just want to show you... Uh, oh. My voice is better now. I got my FM radio voice. Oh, yeah, it looks much better like this. Okay, uh, this one was complicated because we went from a CG shot to mix with a plate. If you look at this, at the end, the camera is kind of moving and kind of shaky, and you may think, like, well, why did it like this? It's, it's a CG shot. No, that's because when we get inside the truck, it's, uh, it's a plate, actually. So we need to track the, the plate and reverse engineer it, actually make it like backwards to make the, the movement, the complete movement with it. So that's the lighting pass. So we put some, some stuff in it, but that's not what's going to be used. Occlusion pass. And this is the final shot with the smoke added in another uh, magician software. And you can see the transition. You cannot tell when it happens. It happens in the smoke, of course. But uh, we did the transition from the plate to the CG. Wah! 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 Okay. <laughs> and that's, uh, the, the, the real shot is actually shorter, but you see all the debris they added in comp, it's insane. Another shot that looks kind of boring, the guy's just on the ground like this, and he's looking at this bright light source. Tracking again, this is almost a node lock, so it's really hard to track. And this is the, the layout shot. And this is a lighting shot. 
And again, we have the character in the foreground. I didn't remove the big light, so it looks kind of weird to have this big light there. But And then you look at the asphalt uh, on the ground, it doesn't look real at all, but we don't care because we use a real one. So it's just uh, we just crossfade it somewhere in the plate. And here we go, that's the final shot. So it's much cheaper than destroying a, broad, uh, a bridge. Okay, now let me tell you about videogrammetry. Because we use videogrammetry on this. Oh, you can keep the light down. Uh, the lights down. Uh, so uh, before I tell you about videogrammetry, I need to tell you about photogrammetry. So photo photogrammetry, if you don't know what it is, is you take an object and you take pictures from every possible angle, and then you bring it into a software, like in this case it's reality capture, and it's going to recreate an object in 3D that you can bring into your favorite uh, 3D software, Blender here, so you get a shaded model, and it's pretty cool. Now somebody thought, hey, what if we try it at 24 frames per second? And this is what videogrammetry is. And to our knowledge, the first movie that used this was Skyfall. And uh, it's called uh, Skyfall because they're falling from the sky. And they use, uh, vi they use videogrammetry for this. And uh, uh, Dave Stum, who works with us at Real by Fake, was on this team when they did this. So some of these shots are videogrammetry. And 10 meters before they hit the ground, pull the parachute. Come on, pull. All right. And of course, they're OK because you know it's James Bond. And this is how it was made. So Dave is the guy in the, in the center. So they were in this wind tunnel here. They used, I think they were 4K cameras. They, they were 14. 4K cameras, and they were the only ones available on the market at the time. So they took them all to do this, uh, to do this job here. So it was really innovative at the time. Nobody has done this before, which is pretty cool when you do something that everybody, uh, uh, nobody ever did before. And this is what it looked like. It's very boxy. But then you have this algorithm that tries to make it you know, better. But it's still you know, very, very basic compared to what I will show you. So if you want to do this, you need a fixed camera system. So you need your cameras to always be at the exact same place because they are calibrated and so it's a bit complicated. You want a con uh, constant uniform lighting because the lighting will be done in CG. Okay? And uh, you need to, an automatic way to cut out the background because you don't want to process everything that you don't need uh, when you do this. So this is our studio. Actually, it could be one of our studios, because this stuff, we can move it anywhere we want. We can box it, we can easily move it and bring it somewhere else. So if we need to shoot something in Amsterdam, we put it on a plane, we bring the system here, we set it up, and we're good to go in about a day to set it up. And uh, that's what the studio looks like. We are the only one in Canada that has this uh, system, and there are just like six in uh, North America. That includes the United States, you know, Hollywood. This is the capture area, the red circle. So it's, uh, it's from three to five meters. Uh, the bigger we get it, the less resolution we get. So if we need something, just somebody going like this for, for a crowd, we're going to go with a smaller circle. And this is how, how it works. So first, you shoot a, a, uh, a, background, a, background, a clean plate. So that's the first image. Nobody is in there. Then you have the person who goes in there to, does it, to do its stuff. And the software will mask everything around the person. In this case, it's uh, represented in blue here. And the software al also knows that there are stuff that will be blocked automatically, like the lights and the cameras, which are represented in green here. So let me show you what, uh, a better explanation, maybe, of what it is. So I got this camera here. And imagine you have a volume. Everything that's blue is the, the volume for the videogrammetry. And what you want to do is cut everything around the character. So you just cut this part. So what do you get if you change the camera angle? Well, you get. You get this. Now you do this from another camera, starting from this geometry here, and you cut from another camera, and you get this. So you do this with all the cameras, and at the end you get a pretty good shape of what the model is going to look like. But this is not the entire way to, this is not the entire process. It's just going to give you like a, a boxy result that later will be, uh, the software will make it more accurate. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, it's very good for mid to background characters. You don't want to go too close because the textures are not high res enough, and the geometry, anyway, will not be high, uh, high resolution enough. It's awesome for crowds. I will show you some examples. Uh, for extras, you shoot something, and then you, don't have, you need more extras in your shot, and it's too late. You already filmed everything. Well, that's the easiest way to add people. That's the way to do it. Uh, we can shoot props, so we can have uh, people with uh, swords or for uh, weapons, and it could be while we do the videogrammetry, or it could be later, we can add it later. 
so we have a way to track. Uh, you could have somebody with just a little stick and we have a way to track the stick so we can uh, replace the thing. We have motion blur. Motion blur is our friend. Okay, if you work in VFX, you know that. And uh, there's a lot of video geometry system out there, but ours can do motion blur and there's not that many of them that can do this because uh, most of them are developed for VR and uh, in VR, they don't care about, uh, about motion blur. Uh, VFX can be good for VFX. I'll show you an example if you want somebody, for example, on fire. Well, uh, you can have a stun guy with a mask and then uh, you throw gas on him and you light him up and uh, you have like three seconds of running and then you, you know, extinguish the guy. Well, with this, you can have the guy burn forever. We can also generate a skeleton. So if you had a shot for somebody transforming into a monster, for example, well, you could track the person in video geometry and you could have a skeleton at the same time that you can apply on your monster and then, you know, in come do the transition, the morph. So uh, it could be used in gaming. Also, there's a plugin that comes with the system for uh, Unreal. So uh, you can bring your stuff. It's a lower resolution, but you can, you can do it. It's affordable. Uh, by affordable, I will show you examples on why it's affordable. No DOP, you don't need your director of photography there uh, because uh, the lighting is, is constant. You do the lighting when you do the 3D. No permits. Again, I will show you an example of what I mean by no permits. And we can move it to different locations, like I said. This is an example where we added the hats on the characters. Now, you may think, okay, well, that's easy. You just take a vertex and you parent something on it, right? But you need to understand that when you do video geometry, the geometry changes every frame. It's not a rigged model. Every frame is different because it captures everything. It captures the performance. So if I move, it's going to capture the folds in my clothes. If my hands are like this and they touch, then the hands are just going to merge together. They're not going to be separate geometry anymore. So the geometry changes every frame. So if this is vertex 1000, maybe next frame vertex 1000 is here and then it's here. So the hat would move all the way around. So how do you do this? Well, we have a secret recipe for that. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> okay, so this shot here, this is a full CG shot. This is the Dakota building in New York. This is where John Lennon was shot in the 80s. So imagine you need to do a shot that's, that happens there. So you want to shoot in New York. You need to close the street. You need to get a, a full crew there. You need security. You need insurance. You need permits. You need all this stuff. It's going to cost you a fortune. That is, if they let you shoot there. Well, in this case, it's a full CG shot. And uh, if you want more characters, it's just a slider, right? You want more characters? Yes, characters. How many do you want? You know, we can do, we have no limits. And the cool thing is, we could do the same shot at night. Same price. So we can do any environment that we want. So that's why I say it's affordable, because you can do shots like this that are full CG, and it's going to be much cheaper than filming in New York. That's for sure. And you can see the light beams of the, the car, the, the light of the policeman and everything. That's pretty cool. That's, that's the cool stuff about uh, video grammetry. Now, this is me getting into a box. This is Embergen. And uh, you can see I flicker from time to time. That's because, that's because Embergen doesn't really support geometry that's changing every frame for Alembics. It kind of works, but it flickers. But it still works for the simulation. And now I'm catching on fire and I'm burning. Now, this is a typical example where you would need videogrammetry because this is just like rig models that you can buy online from libraries and you never see anybody's face because their faces are not animated. So it would look very boring. So everybody is, you know, nobody's looking forward. You know, they're all from the back. Uh, except for this guy here in front and he's super blurry because uh, they want to hide that he doesn't have any expressions. So if you want to make something more realistic, you need to do a presentation for a, a tram that's going to cost $13 billion, well, why don't you spend a little bit of money on your presentation and use video grammatry instead of these cheap characters? The bad. Okay, so it doesn't support transparent objects. So uh, because if you have like a water bottle, it's not going to work for the, for the video grammatry. It's not going to work. Fine details, we cannot capture anything smaller than six millimeters. So if you have a cigarette, it's probably going to fade in and out. Uh, sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it won't. So it's a bit complicated. Free flowing hair. Not going to work because it's smaller than six millimeter. A reflective material, if you did any uh, photogrammetry, you know that anything metallic is not going to work well because when you move the camera angle, the reflections are different, so it's not working. And green cloth because we're shooting on a green screen. If you have army people, that works. Khaki colors works, but if, too, if it's too close to the green screen, we run into issues. The ugly. Okay, so the geometry changes every frame. As I said, the textures change every frame also. 
So if you want to paint out a logo on someone's shirt, you would have to do it for every single frame. So if you have a 500 frame, 500 frame sequence, good luck painting it out and that it uh, doesn't show. Size of the volume, we're limited to five meters, as I said. We can change the shader much because it's just one surface and one texture. So how do you isolate a leather coat from the skin? There are ways to do it, but you need the leather coat to be blue. <laughs> and I will show you later. Not with a leather coat, but uh, what we can do to change some, some stuff. Uh, the amount of people that you can capture at the same time. It's a camera system that captures from 32 different angles. So if you have too many people, you get some occlusions, occlusions, uh, different kind of occlusions, and then you lose details. There are sometimes there are no cameras that can see a specific point, so uh, it's not going to work well. Also, each character has 65,000 polys, but if you have 10 people, it's going to divide these 65,000 polys to the 10 people. So uh, you will lose a lot of resolution doing this. And the processing time is not a real-time thing, definitely not a real-time thing. This is an example of the texture. So you see, try to paint out something, it's just not possible. Uh, we created an add-on to import our stuff to make it easier. So here I can select my thing and I will decide how many variations that I want. So in a sequence, it's just gonna take different ones here and uh, different parts in the sequence. And here I have the blue key texture. This is something that I created so that we could key the characters. So if they have a blue shirt, I could key them in Blender and change the color. So you see when I import them, they all have a different, uh, a different colors. The distribute thing is an add-on that I created. Go check my Blender channel. Uh, thank you, ChatGPT. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't code. ChatGPT does all my add-ons. Uh, so uh, here, if I select, for example, the face, you can see I can key any color on my characters. You can see she was wearing a blue shirt. So I will go back to the blue. And that's pretty cool. And we have a lot of settings that you can play with. Uh, of course, everybody will have a different shade of blue. So you can play with the hue, the, the, the saturation, and the, the value for the blue to get the exact blue that you need for, for the keying. And then all the settings under are for tweaking. So I can change the seed, the hue variations. If I lower it, everybody will get kind of the similar tone of colors. And uh, the more you make it, the more variation you will get. And we have four different algorithms to create the, the, the different colors. So some will have uh, more realistic looks. Some will have more like kind of the same colors. So anyway, yeah, I'm not going to show you them all. But uh, so yeah, we can you know change the saturation. Should have made this shorter. Okay, so I will show you my blue laser pointer and this. No, okay. Uh, now the cool thing about this is that if I copy all these women and I copy them even as instances, they will all get different colors. So that's pretty cool. It, it works with instances too. So I can fill out an entire stadium and will not see these uh, repeat, repeating patterns. Um, <coughs> Well, that is the same thing I just showed you. We also have another way to change the colors, but this one, uh, they're not dressed in blue, but there's still some stuff that we can do with the shaders without affecting too much the skin tone. So even the jeans change color. So that's uh, another method that we have. The cool thing is because it's full 3D, we can put the camera any way we want. So we, we don't, we're not limited. Like if you shoot on a green screen, you're stuck with that angle that you shot. With this, you don't have any limits. So this is an example with six people at the same time. And if you look at the ground, you can see there's some flickering. That's because there's not enough cameras that can see the detail to create their videogrammetry. But once they start moving, the feet are fine. Uh, it works well on the ground. And this is what I was telling you, the woman doing the karate kid thing. Uh, this is the full 65,000 polys. But with the six girls, it's spreaded on all of them. So you can see the loss of resolution that we have. And this is the bridge, uh, the bridge shot I was telling you at the beginning. So we added these policemen here. And once it's comped, it's done like this. Now imagine in uh, you're, you're the director, the shot is done and it's a real shot. For example, it's shot uh, outside and says, oh, I want to add some people there. And you want to shoot this on green screen. How, how are you going to do this? You would need to track the shot. You would need to get the data from the camera, bring it to a motion control system, a big robot that will redo the camera movement. We have the system at Real by Fake, by the way. 
And then you would, have to, you would have to shoot on a green screen, but what about all the lights, the car lights and everything? How, do you, are, how are you going to match the light if you shot, shoot this on a green screen? It's a nightmare. This is an easy solution. Another case here. So you cannot tell that these are not real people, and we can add as many people as we want. Same thing here. You know, if you, if you had to shoot this on a green screen, I imagine you have the light, you have the shadows, so you would have like a double shadow from the characters and the real shadows from the plate, and you would have to in comp, make sure that the shadows match and they don't overlap. And, and you have the lights also from the car, and that lights the policeman. If you have to do it in, on, a, on a green screen, well, forget it. And you also have the camera movement too, so uh, getting a motion control at that height, forget it, it's not gonna happen. And a last shot with uh, videogrammetry. Now let's talk about crowds. The usual way to do crowd, the old way to do crowd was to use, in this case, it's a motion control camera. So it's a robot that does the same movement again and again and again. And you shoot different people at different places and then you come them together. That's how you can fill the entire room with just a few people. That's, that's how stadiums were done a long time ago. On, uh, on Rocketman, they use cards on green screen. So a lot of cards, a lot of people. And that's how they filled up the stadium. They did the same thing for Bohemian Rhapsody. So uh, here, these are all cards in there in the back. Now, there's a problem with cards. The problem is that if you move the camera too much, well, they become flat because they are cards. So you, cannot, you have a limit on how much you can move the camera. But if there are 3D people, you can do whatever you want. Also, because there are 3D characters, you can relight the scene, it's gonna work. If you use a card, you cannot relight a card to a certain limit, but you cannot like a, a big light coming from the side, it's not gonna happen, it's a flat surface. So this is a test shot that we did here. So it's all done in cycles. I'm losing my voice. So in this case, we have about uh, 18 people, different people in there. So they all have set. They all have different colors of clothes. So, it's, you know, you, you would need to stop it. Whoops. You would need to go back. You would need to stop it somewhere. I don't know how to stop it in there. Anyway, you would have to stop it and try to see which people is the same, you know, which one correspond to. Uh... So that's a, that's a, it's, it's just a test shot. So um, imagine if we take time and we spend more time on it, what we could do, we could fill, out, fill up a stadium like this very easily. And this is how I did it. When I bought the stadium, uh, all the seats were combined into one big group. So you have uh, 180,000 seats. So what I did was to select some polygons and go coplan R to select just the top of the seats. I inverted the selection, deleted everything. Then I took all the stuff and I separated into uh, loose parts. So now I have a, a little plane for every seat there, but I don't need to carry all that geometry. What I need is a single vertex to instance it. So I will create a single vert here. That's with the uh, extra object add-on that comes with Blender. Select all these objects and just link the, camera uh, link the object data. So now they are all single dots. I don't need this one anymore. Can select all these vertices, pick one of them and I combine them and that's how I get one geometry for every seat in there. And then I use a very, very simple geometry node script And what it does is uh, it actually checks the orientation of the characters so that it will follow a singer or a leader or whatever, follow an object. And there's a collection for the crowd, so you can put any object that you want in the collection. It's going to update automatically. So that's my uh, crowd collection here, a bunch of Suzanne. And the sphere here, that's my, my singer, for example. So if the singer moves on stage, well, all the everybody in the crowd will look so I can have my entire stadium filled with people and they will all look at the same place. That's pretty cool. So uh, I had the setup here where I made this uh, high low uh, definition so I can say like zero, I don't see anything. One is uh, just bonding box, wireframe. The other one is just box. And then I see the full geometry because if you want to show the entire stadium with all the characters, it becomes really, really heavy. So sometimes you just want to make it, you know, work. It's easier to work with the bounding boxes instead. And I can play with the density also. So I have a little slider, I can move the density. So 
that's when I move around. So this is with a 4090, so you can see it's having a hard time with a 4090 because there's 230,000 people, I think. So that's a lot of stuff to manipulate. So reduce this back to one. Now the all bonding box and it goes super fast. Now, uh, when I render this, uh, it's all in different layers, all the layers that you can see there. But now I turned on all the lights just to show you how long it takes to render something like this. So this is in real time. Now, for every frame, it needs to reload all the textures for all the characters because it changes every frame. And here we go. So now I'm doing 256 samples. And you see, it's still going pretty fast. And uh, you know, when you render, it always goes faster at the end. So 112, 128. And this is time for me to drink water. And uh, 240, 256. So it took. 1 minute 36 seconds to render this in uh, full HD, which is not bad, huh? with all the lights, uh, all the lights at the same time, which is a lot of lights. Uh, the fog, that's another, <laughs> that's another story. Actually, when I did the fog, and the first time I did this stadium shot, I did the fog in EV because uh, it was impossible to render in, uh, uh, in uh, cycles. Help me, please. And uh, th yeah, this is with everything rendered when I try to move the camera, it's too slow. But uh, with, the, with the 4090, we can render the fog directly in cycle. And uh, we can have our characters do the wave if we want to. So I will finish with this shot here. Uh, you can see the wireframe here. That's actually from Google Earth. We extracted the data from Google Earth to make sure that we're in the right position at the right scale and everything. We never use the Google Earth stuff for rendering. It's just for placement to make sure that everything fits. This is the lighting shot. Yeah, don't ask about the simulation. <laughs> and this is the final shot. So it took us a year to do this movie. Uh, the CG team is about 10 people who worked on this. It was a lot of work. It was the biggest project we ever made. Uh, we had a lot of issues that we had to work with, uh, we had to deal with, and uh, we've been through it. And we finished in time and on budget, which is pretty cool. So. Thank you so much. And now go on YouTube and check Blender Bob. Thank you.